most clearly in talks between the U.S. and Iran on talks on regulating the nuclear issue in return for suspending sanctions. Those talks are set to resume in just a few days with the Secretary of State and the Iranian Foreign Minister. And while an agreement is not imminent or even certain, it does appear promising. In fact, according to the chief U.S. negotiator, they've made impressive progress on issues that seemed intractable, which when you think of it, can't really remember the last time that a U.S. official would have spoken that positively about talks with Iran. Another part of this easing of tension, perhaps, is the shared fight against ISIS. In parts of Iraq on the battlefield, we have seen U.S. airstrikes and Iranian artillery. On the ground. Do we still have the microphone? Yes. That extraordinary sight, if you look out on this vast battlefield and you see the U.S. airstrikes playing a pivotal role, in some of those fights as well, on the ground, although out of sight, there have been Iranian advisors with Iranian artillery, all of them working towards the same goal. Now, there's no obvious cooperation, or no obvious coordination, rather, but there is an implicit coordination going on, a cooperation going on. The fight against ISIS has brought is not going to be easy to overcome. So we have these wonderful panelists here. As you know, as a journalist, we don't always have the answers, but we always have questions. So I have lots of them, and I'm sure you'll have lots of questions too. We were to have been joined by the Iranian Consul General in Erbil. Um, he, at the last minute, unfortunately, could not make it. American officials have also been invited, and they were unable to come. But that's actually good news for us, because we have more time for our guests. David Pollack from the Washington Institute, formerly of the State Department, and uh, the Kurdistan region's own Hiwa Osman, who is a political a journalist, a former advisor to former President Jalal Talabani, and someone who has seen almost every pivotal event from the inside and the outside take questions after these brief remarks from the audience and hopefully watching on the live stream who are asking questions Twitter, hashtag Mary forum so um, dr. Pollock why don't we start with you okay thanks so much to you Jane and uh, especially to Mary and to its director professor Delauer for inviting me here and for organizing this conference. I really feel honored to be here and I've had a chance to talk with many of you and hope to meet more of you later today and tomorrow. And I found it to be a very interesting and stimulating time, time very well spent. Even though it took me two days to get here and it's going to take me two days to get back home to Washington. But I do appreciate it very much. I want to start with just a couple of personal remarks to set the stage and then I'm going to talk about a few general topics as I'll explain in a moment. But first the personal remarks. I have to say that although as Jane just mentioned and as you can read in the bio in the program I was once in the US government in the State Department. That was a few years ago and I today am expressing only my own personal opinion. This has is in no way an expression of official American policy on this very, very sensitive subject. It's just me, not the U.S. government or the State Department speaking. Secondly, uh, this is a subject, U.S.-Iran relations is a subject of very, very intense debate in the United States and I think probably also in Iran. There are people who feel very strongly and very sincerely on opposite sides of this debate in each country. There are people in the United States who really, really want a rapprochement with Iran and there are those who are really, really nervous about it or opposed to it for various reasons. And I think, although I can't know for sure from this distance, I think 
that something similar is probably also happening inside Iran. I think there are probably people in Iran and people in the Iranian government who would like to make a deal on the nuclear issue and would like to make deals with the United States on other regional crises and maybe also business deals with the United States. And I think there are people in Iran right now who actually view this whole process with great suspicion and apprehension and maybe will try to spoil it if they can, find ways to short circuit the possibility of dialogue or of deals with the United States. And that leads me to two more quick, or maybe three more quick personal points. I find myself, I'll tell you right off the bat, skeptical personally about the prospects for U.S.-Iranian rapprochement. Things have changed. The United States and Iran are at least talking to each other. And I think that's a good thing. I think it would also be a good thing if the two sides could agree on an acceptable nuclear deal. And on other issues, including the fate of Kurdistan, the fate of Syria, the fate of Hezbollah in Lebanon, the fate of the entire Sunni-Shi'i conflict across the region, it would be a good thing if the United States and Iran, in my personal view, could reach an acceptable compromise or an agreement on all of those issues. But sadly and honestly, I don't think it's very likely that this will happen. I think the problems are too serious, the disagreements are too deep, and the internal opposition on both sides, as I mentioned in my introduction, is probably too strong to allow a full rapprochement between the United States and Iran to happen in the foreseeable future. And I think that the election that just happened in the United States, whose results we just heard about this morning, in which the Republican Party took control of the Senate, the U.S. Senate, which although it might not have to officially approve a deal with Iran, will certainly make its voice heard about it and will be reflected in the media in the United States. I think that that adds another layer of difficulty to the prospects for major progress in U.S.-Iranian relations. And finally, in addition to my uh, regular job as a fellow at the Washington Institute, I run a blog. It's bilingual in English and in Arabic. Unfortunately, not yet also in Kurdish. But I run a blog. It's called Fikra Forum, Muntada Fikra. And I welcome dialogue on this issue and on other important regional issues from all of you. I hope that some of you will take the time just to click on this blog where you will see ideas and opinions and analysis from people in this region reaching out to an American audience and Americans, experts in some cases, activists or officials in other cases, academics and so on, reacting to your suggestions and your ideas. So please check out Fikra Forum and write a post for us about Iran or anything else if you like. Now let me turn to the main subjects that I would like to briefly discuss. There are three issues that I want to talk about. One is the nuclear issue between Iran and the United States. Two is the collection of all the other regional issues that divide Tehran from Washington right up until today, and a few issues where they do seem, as Jane said, to be working together against Daesh, against ISIS, for example. So one, the nuclear issue, two, other regional issues, and three, maybe a little bit unusual in a conference like this, 
I would like to say a few words about the people in the region, not just the governments, not just official policies, but what ordinary people, what average people on the street think about Iran, about the U.S., and about U.S.-Iranian rapprochement, and what that means for the political issues. Let me start with the nuclear issue. I think the recent signals coming from both capitals in the last week are very positive, actually, about the possibility of reaching an agreement on the nuclear file before the November 24th deadline, just less than three weeks away. One signal coming from Washington last Friday was the announcement that Secretary Kerry will be meeting in Oman next week with his Iranian counterpart, along with the EU chief negotiator, or the, the chief of uh, EU foreign policy, um, Catherine Ashton, who is still following this issue, even after her official retirement from that position. So it seems to me, I'm just guessing, I don't have any solid inside information, but it seems to me that Secretary Kerry would not make this kind of trip and would not make a public announcement about it unless there was at least a reasonable chance of making some further progress toward a deal with Iran on the nuclear issue. And then there was another signal in just the last few days, this one coming from Russia, of all places, but apparently nobody denied it. And that was that the Iranians have agreed, according to this Russian announcement, to ship out some of their uranium stockpile to Russia for safekeeping in case a deal is reached. This was an idea that started a while ago. And the Iranians, at one point, seemed to come close to accepting it and then rejected it which is actually kind of typical of their behavior, and typical also of the behavior, apparently, of the Consul General of Iran right here in Erbil. But now this idea is back on the table, and it seems to me to be another positive signal that a deal on the nuclear issue is at least a, a real possibility. And the third signal came, I just saw it on my email five minutes ago, uh, with the leak, it's not an official announcement, but it's a leak by an Iranian uh, semi-government, semi-official website that the United States would be willing to allow Iran 6,000 centrifuges as part of a comprehensive deal on this issue. 6,000 is more than what the United States leaked a few weeks ago, but it's much less than the 19,000 Iranian centrifuges that are operating today to enrich uranium. So this is a, a kind of a magic number that's, that may be another positive signal that a deal is possible. It's not clear, it's not certain. I think probably even the negotiators themselves aren't sure but I think the possibility exists. So what does that mean? Two points, very quickly, about this issue before I move on to other regional issues. Even if a deal is reached on the nuclear issue, according to the best, the most optimistic expert assessments, and according to Secretary Kerry's own public statements, at best, it will leave Iran a year away from a breakout capability, just one year away from the possibility of tearing up the agreement and manufacturing a nuclear bomb after all, after sanctions have been lifted, presumably. And that means in my mind, and I wrote an article about this uh, in the last year that you can also find on um, the Washington Institute website if you're interested. That means 
that a deal by itself is not the end of this issue. Even if there is a deal, the question will remain, what does the United States do, what does the rest of the world do, if Iran decides to end the agreement after they sign it? If Iran decides that it really does want a bomb after all, what are we going to do? And so the question is not just a piece of paper, an agreement, but how to enforce that agreement. Will sanctions be reimposed after they're lifted? I doubt it. And they probably won't be quick enough to make Iran stop. So even after there is a deal on the nuclear issue, in my own mind, I still see the possibility of people at least feeling that they have to consider military action in case Iran breaks the deal. That's point number one. Point number two, if there is an Iranian-American deal on the nuclear issue, it will make other countries in the region, not just Israel, but Israel for sure, but also the Gulf Arab countries, and probably Turkey, and probably even Egypt. It will make them quite nervous about whether Iran has succeeded in getting a breakout nuclear capability by agreement with the United States. And I think even a pretty good nuclear deal with Iran will make these other countries more interested in obtaining their own nuclear weapons capability if they don't already have it. And that means that it will be up to the United States and Iran if they want to prevent a nuclear arms race in the whole region to find some way to reassure all of these other countries that a nuclear deal doesn't mean a new and worse threat to their security from Iran. This is not just about the US and Iran. It's about every other or almost every other country in the region. So let me turn very quickly to these other countries. Iran's policy in the region, as viewed from Washington, is a problem in many, many places. In Syria, where Iran supports still the Assad regime. In the Gulf, where Iran supports opposition, mostly Shia, to be just blunt about it, forces in places like Saudi Arabia or Yemen or Bahrain. In Lebanon, where Iran supports Hezbollah, which as you know, the United States officially considers a terrorist organization. And in all of those areas, it's very hard for me to see how the United States and Iran can find common ground. There are even some people right here in Erbil that I talk to, not officials, but people who pay close attention to these issues, who say that maybe the US and Iran can trade the nuclear issue for other issues. Maybe Iran will compromise on the nuclear issue if the United States quietly, we'll never say this out loud, if the United States agrees, okay, Assad can stay. You can win Iran in Syria if you give us what we need on the nuclear issue. Is that a realistic possibility? Theoretically, perhaps. But in practice, I don't think it's possible for the US and Iran to find much common ground on any of these issues anytime soon. The one issue where there is common ground, and where I agree with Jane, where Iran and the United States are quietly coordinating, at least in the negative sense of not getting in each other's way, not fighting against each other, is the common enemy of Daesh, or ISIS. 
And here, Iran and the United States are supporting the same side. The Iraqi government, the Kurdistan regional government, and other forces in the region, even some of the Gulf Arabs who are on the same side against Daesh. We all find ourselves facing a common enemy and a common threat. And I think, actually, this is a good thing because ISIS is probably the worst extremist threat that the region has faced ever. And so anyone who is willing to sign on, either officially or quietly, secretly, to fight against ISIS deserves to be included in this informal coalition. It's just that I don't think this common interest translates into other areas, into Syria or Lebanon or Yemen or Bahrain or Saudi Arabia or other places where Iran's ambitions run exactly counter to the interests of the United States and its allies. You might say, well, if there's such a, an opposition between Iran and the United States in those other areas, doesn't that mean that they would both be better off if they could reach a compromise deal? Yes, again, theoretically. But in practice, maybe you can tell me what that compromise would be. I can't see it. I can't figure it out. Finally, I want to talk about the people. Iran and the United States share one other thing in this region besides their common enmity to ISIS. And that is that generally, based on public opinion polls that I do here in the Middle East, and that again you can read about on my website, Iran and the United States are both disliked by most people here in the region. Here in Iraq, by Kurds, by Arabs, even by Shia Arabs. Most of them don't like Iran, and they don't like the United States either. And that's true all over the region, in every country where there are public opinion polls, whether it's an ally of the United States, like Egypt or Saudi Arabia, or a country that is basically an enemy of the United States. Most people in the region don't like either Iran or the United States. And what that means, I think, is that unlike what most people talk about when they talk about U.S.-Iranian relations or uh, rivalry or rapprochement, right, that means that the people of this region, Kurds, Arabs, Turks, Sunni, Shia, wherever they are, the people of this region are the ones who will have to decide their own fate, whether the US and Iran reach an agreement with each other or not. This region is not a toy of Iran and the United States. If Iran and the United States reach an agreement, even if they do with each other, that will not solve the problems that the people of the region have to solve for themselves. They don't want Iran and the United States to tell them what to do. And so Iran and the United States will not be able to tell them what to do with their own future. And finally, just a word about the people inside Iran itself. In all of this talk about Iran-U.S. discussions, negotiations, relations, not too many people have reminded us that Iranians continue to suffer from the oppression of their own government inside Iran. Whether Kurds or Persians or Arabs, Sunni or Shia, whoever they are, they are living under a regime as some Iranian refugees here in Erbil reminded me just today. They are living under a regime that denies them the most basic human rights of free expression, of freedom of religion, of real democracy. 
of the opportunity to express political opposition without being tortured and thrown in jail. And unfortunately, there is very little that anyone in the world, not the United States, not the UN, not anyone, is able to do about this problem. And even if the US and Iran mend their own differences with each other, the people of Iran will not be satisfied, I believe, in the long run. That is an issue that, as I said, only the people, the Kurds of Iran, the Persians, the Arabs, the others, only the people of Iran will be able to fix that issue for themselves in the long run. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.